now. So that means this is a uh, session is being recorded. So don't say anything that you you know don't want to be um, recorded, and so on and so forth. So um, let's uh, let's begin then, and I am going to share my application screen with you, and in just a moment you're going to see a PowerPoint slide. And uh, there you are, and I'll make that into a, oh, a full-fledged PowerPoint slide. So this is the 131 uh, lecture. <clears throat> now I'm going to uh, go to sort of an outline of talking points uh, about what I'm going to, what I plan to talk about uh, and, uh, and how we're going to proceed. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I do have good news, and then I have other good uh, other news. And I don't know if the other news is bad news or not. It's just news. But we will talk about that. Uh, I'll also give you a little bit of my idea as a, you know using my model of uh, <clears throat> this being a plane. And uh, Jesse Hayes Carver and I are the uh, co-pilot and pilot, respectively. And um, you're our passengers, and uh, you know, and we're on our way there, and things like that. So I'll talk a little bit about how I think we are right now. Uh, before we start recovering content, which is one of the things we definitely are going to do tonight, I want to do some polling. So I'm going to check in with each one of you. And <clears throat> again, uh, it could be just, uh, uh, yeah, we're all fine, and I don't have any questions. Or some of you might have questions or issues or things that you want to share in front of the group and, and for me to respond to, and I'm happy to do that. And I will poll each and every one that I have on my little list, uh, and then we'll wade into some content for the evening. Uh, I am prepared uh, to revisit both LSAs 1 and LSA 2 tonight. I guess I'm revisiting LSA 1 and uh, visiting LSA2. Actually, maybe I'm introducing both of them, it kind of doesn't matter, but I am going to talk about those. And then I do have a game plan for tonight, and I, I, I do uh, watch the clock. I know what time it is. And I went through this arithmetic uh, sometime last week with you, uh, but what you guys are paying for is basically 100 hours of quality instruction um, per session of this class. And that's uh, that's all good. And with my experience, I've learned that um, oh, probably the limit, roughly, of how long a student can uh, pay attention to me um, is um, 75 minutes. That's an hour and 15 minutes. We started at seven ish, and that means at 8:15 ish, we will take a break. Now, that's actually more than half of the time that we spend, but we will take a 10 minute break then. So when you're making your plans about hydrating yourself or trips to the bathroom, or I don't know what you do, um, as you're making those plans, just realize that more or less around 8.15, I will break. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we will reconvene and we'll spend 25 more minutes at the tail end. That'll be the shorter portion of the class. So anyway, this is what's uh, this is what's going on. This is what I have in plan, have planned for this evening. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, good news. Uh, I opened my email this morning. Actually, I had my email open before this arrived, but I saw this arrive, so I read it. And it was from uh, Brian Caputo, who is the president of the College of DuPage. And I know you can read, but I'll read it to you. College of DuPage community. And by the way, you guys are certainly part of the community. But when I look at this to list, I don't see this that this was sent to the students. Uh, but it was sent to many, uh, everybody else, everybody who works for the College of DuPage, I guess. And here's what it says. Uh, College of DuPage community. Over the past several days, the COVID-19 indicators have moved in an encouraging direction. Based upon the trends, the college will resume regular in-person instruction on February the 7th. Now, you might say, well, why is this news? This has always been the plan. Well, it was the plan from when we went remote at the beginning, but <clears throat> I will tell you that there were many faculty people who were watching the statistics and they were really wondering if this would happen. 
but this is a confirmation from the leadership of the college that it is going to uh, happen. And I consider this very good news. And in fact, uh, Brian was walking into the college and I was walking out of the Learning Commons this morning and I, uh, I greeted him and I told him I really you know, was excited about this news. Uh, he further says, our objective remains to keep the college community as healthy and safe as reasonably possible, of course. Uh, we will continue to monitor environmental conditions and plan future actions with that objective in mind. But I'm really encouraged with this. This is what I'm calling good news. And that means one week from tonight, instead of doing it this way, we are going to be in a classroom that was a classroom that we were assigned early on. And um, that's what I hope we all are able to do for the rest of this class. So that is my good news. Now, here is my, um, I don't know, it is news news, and it's kind of <clears throat> the terms and conditions. Now, this came to me this morning, later, about an hour after uh, Dr. Caputo's note. This was from uh, Diana Del Rosario, and she is the assistant provost, and uh, this was a message. But what the title of this message was, student message. 12822, COVID testing or proof of vaccination needed. Now, and, and I am going to read this, uh, the, you know, this note to you. Uh, but what she is saying is, oh, we sent this message to all the students. Now, I will tell you that the administration um, probably has an exaggerated view of how accurately you read your uh, student emails. And, and things like that. And that's not saying you're bad people, I just think you're busy and I have to send stuff to you and I put it on the announcements and I send you emails and stuff. But she is telling, okay, we sent this to students. Now I will tell you, she is walking around thinking, uh, and again, I'm not belittling her at all, I respect her, but she is thinking that, oh, my job is done. The students understand this completely. I am investing some of our valuable class time to talk to you about this because I'm not sure that you guys saw this message. I'm not sure you understood the message the way I want to make sure that you do understand it. And so that's what I'm doing this. And she was just letting us know that she sent this message. So anyway, here we go. Dear colleagues, the message below, I'm not showing what it is, but it was reminding students of this, was sent to students uh, registered for spring 2022. And that's all of you, you are registered for this, uh, this spring and scheduled for face-to-face -face and hybrid courses starting February the 7th, reminding them of how to get ready to be in compliance. And there's a loaded word, in compliance. I'll talk about what that means with the COD vaccination and testing requirements ahead of coming on campus next week. And these messages are, are sent by the Dean of Students. Uh, this is uh, Nathaniel Montez. Um, she's a friend of mine, uh, but anyway, she, she sends us, this is her job. Um, contact information and links to processes to be used are included in this email you're supposed to get. Students who are not in compliance, not cleared to be on campus as a result of not loading their vaccination cards and or the completion of the form that goes with it or not completing shield testing on campus are encouraged to visit the student vaccination compliance page on our website and there's a link. They can also receive um, support through her, that is uh, Nathaniel Montez. Uh, office. Thanks for uh, supporting this. Okay, now maybe you know all about this and things like that. And actually, talking about this is not my favorite thing to do because I'd much rather be talking about math. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, talk about this. So uh, here's what the deal is: Stud and on my roster that I have for this class, it has a listing. And it says either you are certified in compliance or you are not certified in compliance. And I will tell you how I'm going to uh, going to deal with that. But this is information they've given me. And they've also told me that for anybody who is not in compliance, I'm supposed to hand them a card 
so that they know that they're not in compliance. So I'm going to say a little bit uh, more about this, but anyway, we have this going on. And I am going to pause very soon to ask if you guys got questions or want to vent or talk about this, things like that. I, venting is not especially useful, but if you have questions, that's, that, that's, that's it. And by the way, if you want to come to my office hours and vent, you can do that, but let's don't spend class time uh, venting about this. So anyway, this is our our process. Now, what I want you to understand is there are two ways um, that this can happen. First of all, you can have your vaccination documented on a thing called a vaccination card, and you can submit it to the college. And some of you have done this. And thank you, those of you who have done this. And those are the people who just say, oh, yes, uh, they're compliant. I don't think I have a Susie in this class. I hope not, uh, be, but because now I'm talking about a hypothetical Su Susie. But if Susie um, is compliant, I'll just, when I look at the class before February 7th, I'll say, oh, yeah, she's compliant. Uh, Susie is good to go. Uh, but then, and I also do not think I have a Jonah in this class. So I have a hypothetical Jonah, but the hypothetical Jonah is not. Uh, listed as being in compliance. Now, so there's two ways to get compliant. One is getting the vaccinations, taking the documentation, and uploading your card. The other way is to just say, I'm going to go regular testing. And so what you will do if you do regular testing, you will go to the SHIELD testing room on campus. This is SRC 2000, and you will get a test. And they'll test you, let's just suppose you went today. Uh, well, you probably aren't going today because they're probably not open right now. But anyway, if you, if let's suppose you went today, uh, they would have you know, tested you and they would, uh, these are very rapid turnaround tests and they would send a test uh, results to you and to the college. And so the test result might say, oh yes, uh, we Jonah tested on this day and he uh, you know, did, did not test positive for COVID, that means that he should be good to go, and that means you are compliant. That's assuming that all this stuff works the way it's supposed to. Okay, so you got two ways to go. No one's forcing you to get vaccinated, but they're saying either you get vaccinated or you do this testing on a, a regular basis and, and, and stay compliant that way uh, in order to do face-to-face classes and this is uh, considered a face-to-face -face class in spite of what we've been doing. Now, I am going to show you, this is on the Blackboard website when you log in and here is more information that's in a video. I'm not going to show you this video, but this video is here. Uh, Natanya Montez is uh, speaking on this video and she says many of the things that I have done and there's a button you can say, uh, take action now. Now I am going to tell you what I plan to do. So the administration has sent me cards and what I don't want to do is I don't want to single out the hypothetical Susie who maybe is not compliant. Uh, I don't want people to say, oh, gee, that's Susie. She's not compliant. No, we won't have any of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these cards and I'm going to fill them out for everybody. And, it's, and, and I'm going to pass them out at the beginning of the, pay, uh, uh, of the period. And, and, and since I don't know what most of you look like, I'll you know, call off your names and you'll raise your hand and then I'll hand you a sheet of paper. Now on this sheet of paper, it will either say whatever I saw on my... Um, uh, class roster, and either they'll say, "Oh, uh, yes, you are you are compliant, no problem, it's all good," or um, what I might say, depending on what it is, I might have written, uh, "You know, my uh, my list says you're not compliant, so you need to take action and talk to me if you need to to figure out how to do that." Uh, but that's how I'm going to do it. So no one's going to be uh, embarrassed or anything like that. Uh, and in fact, this will help me learn your names because I do want to know your names. And, you know, if I run into your hall, I want to greet you and, um, and so on and so forth. And in class, I want to be able to call on you uh, by name. So that's what Jim is going to do. Now, I've got one more thing that I'm going to pause if there's questions or comments. Um, 
uh, we are going to adhere to all the masking and stuff. And, and this really says all of that stuff that I just kind of uh, said. And this is a, yet another thing. So there's a lot of information about this on the, uh, on the COD um, website. So anyway, I'm about ready to um, begin polling. I'm going back, back here. So that was all of this. Good news and other news. And uh, I guess I'm going to, I'm changing the order of this because I can always just change the order of this. And so I'm going to cut this, not throw it away. We are going to do that, but I'm going to do that after I do the polling uh, with you guys. Okay. So I've changed this, this around a bit, but that's the order I'm going to do it. So now I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to go back to Blackboard and I'm going to look at the attendees in the class. And these are going to be, uh, I, it looks to me like these are alphabetical order in, um, uh, by first name. Okay, so that's how I'm doing it. I'm just going down the list. So you will get a turn, so don't worry about that. But if you need to follow on, you can you can do that too. Okay, uh, and you can, um, it's not called texting. You can chat uh, and just say, uh, you know, I, I don't have anything. Or you can speak, you can go on mic and speak and it's all good. So I'm gonna do everybody with this. And if you got any questions or comments you want to share either about the course or about, you know, um, the stuff I just talked about uh, or something, uh, we certainly can, uh, can do that. Uh, Akshar, you are my number one person because the A-K-S-H-A-R comes before everything else. So Akshar, uh, how are you and yours? I hope that birthday celebration that you told me about was good. And um, um, and, and just uh, how are you and yours? And do you have any questions or comments uh, for me or for the class tonight? Uh, it was really good. Thank you for asking. And no, I do not have any questions right now, but thank you. Okay. Now, and I'm not going to say this over and over again. Well, I do say things over and over again. Uh, but uh, I expect Akshar to ask a question when he has them in you know, so that will be good. Okay, great. I will go to Christopher uh, Wilson. Chris, it's good to see you. I actually, I'm not seeing you, but it's good uh, maybe to try to talk with you. Uh, so how are you and yours, Chris? And do you have um, any, uh, and, and by the way, there probably are more than one Christopher uh, Wilson. Are you the Christopher Wilson that I knew from differential equations? Yes. Okay, that's, uh, well, that's good to see you. And wow, what is that? Uh, is that like a asteroid or something? What is that? Uh, that's You're the off? supernova. Oh, okay, that's cool. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, so uh, so how are you and yours? And uh, do you have any questions or comments you need to share with the class or me? Um, I'm doing good, um, and I don't really have any questions right now. Thank you. Okay, that's good. We'll just we'll just move on then. Again, I'm I'm anxious to get into material. Uh, Denny Janiak, Denny. Um, so how are you and yours? And anything you want to raise? Uh, doing well, thank you. Um, I have no questions. All right, excellent. That's fine. Uh, Evan Link, uh, you are next, and so how are you? And do you have anything you want to raise? Uh, doing well, thank you. Um, I have no questions at this time. All right, excellent. Uh, Fazan, um, and Fazan, I think you might be studying another class with me uh, too, because I, I have, or at least I have another student with the same name as you. But anyway, how are you, and do you have anything you want to raise a bit about this uh, linear algebra class? He is good with no questions, and I'm assuming everybody can see. In fact, he sent that to everyone, so that's good. And again, you can do that. You know, if you want to, if you don't want to go off mic, and sometimes students have tech, technical difficulties. In fact, I sometimes have technical difficulties. Uh, Justin uh, Varghese, Justin, uh, how are you? And do you have any questions you want to raise at this time about anything? Hi, I'm doing well. Um, I don't have any questions at the moment. Thank you for asking. Okay, excellent. That's all good. It's good if you have questions. It's good if you don't have questions. It, that doesn't uh, matter so much. Uh, Marius uh, Mueller, um, do you have questions or comments at this time? Uh, 
my question regarding I need to go back and read that again bear with me for a second I read part of it. my question regarding in-person teaching was answered oh okay so yeah we're we're okay um, I mean yes I'm all right so we will go on I go back then to the list and now I'm to uh, Matthias um, Niesel. Uh so Matthias how are you and yours and uh, do you have any questions at this time hello I'm doing pretty decent uh, thanks for asking, and uh, I don't have any questions at this moment. All right, that's uh, that's all good. Uh, Matthew Steger, you are next, and do you have any uh, questions or comments for the class? And he's saying not at this time. Okay, so I have a uh, Ms. Bob Shake uh, next. So I'm asking, how are you, and do you have any questions you want to raise at this time? Hey, Professor, I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay. Um, the, the the COVID things are messed up for everybody, and and you know I mean so. But uh, I'm doing okay. Yes, and thank you for asking. Do you have any questions though? Um, I do actually. Um, have you go ahead. given us the low stake assessment, or is that going to come like later on? Well, I, I'm going to be talking about that now. And in fact, what I might what I'm going to try to do is I maybe I will take uh, and I'll take the slides out of order. That is fine. I will talk about the low stakes assessment, and I will probably during our break uh, today do that. So, uh, no, I haven't, but that's coming, and I will speak to that, and I will plan on speaking to that uh, maybe as the first order of business whenever we really start doing work. Okay. Um, I had another question, too, actually. Um, for me, this past weekend, uh, going back over and listening to the recordings actually really helped me kind of like uh, absorb the material even further. So I was just wondering when we do go back into class, is there any possible way that we might be able to record those lectures at all? Well, I can um, explore that and I'm not opposed to that. Okay. okay. Uh, but it is a different environment like in, in, uh, in, in the room, what I will use. And, and again, I'm just assuming you've been in, in the classrooms in the BIC. If you haven't, you know, that's okay too. Uh, but we have devices called ladybugs in, in there and ladybugs are capable of recording things and i use the ladybugs a lot oh during the uh, during the presentations and i will look into that but recording this um lecture online is a blackboard ultra kind of thing and so it's a different technology so i will promise you that i will look into it but I don't know exactly and technically how I would um, uh, best do such a thing. So I, I just have to say I will look into it and we'll see what I can do. Okay, thank you so much. That's all my questions. Okay, uh, let's see. We are uh, Omar. Um, uh, we are to you. Uh, how are you and yours? And uh, do you have any questions for the group? And it looks like you're open mi or on mic, but I'm not hearing you. So I don't know if um, there's a technical issue, maybe on my end or your end. So I'm not sure. Hello? Yes, now I can hear you. Although it was a okay. little bit clipped. Um, so how are you? Oh, hi, I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Um, I had a quick question about the uh, supplemental videos. Uh, when we go back to in-person learning, will you keep uh, posting those? Uh, that's going to be another one that I'm going to say I don't know. Now, if I record the videos we do in class, then I'll do that. And actually, I became quite, oh, during the COVID times, I, I, I became, um, and I'm not going to say I became good at it, but I became very into making videos. And uh, one of the things that's really good is, uh, and I'm just telling you the way I am, um, one thing that makes me very relaxed about talking to you guys this way and being casual at the beginning of class, I think that's a good thing. But also I know that I'm not going to have a, tr a problem covering the material because if I don't cover the material exactly in class, I'll make the videos that will be there and, 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 and you know, I can, I can make videos. And sometimes I even make special videos that are about, you know, different things. So um, 
I, I guess I would say to be determined, and part of that will depend on you. Certainly, I um, am interested in making this as rich a course as possible, and sometimes there's more than than you can fit into, you know, just the class sessions. And so I may I may make some more videos. Uh, I've got to tell you, I haven't thought that that far. In fact, until today. I wasn't as confident as I am now that we're going to go back face to face. So I will think and I will see. And um, uh, I do work hard at making the videos. Um, and if students you know, watch them as, uh, as active learners, I think it can be a, a decent way to learn some things. So uh, to be determined, and, and maybe I will be making some, I, I, I don't know. And I'm, so, I'm not trying to dodge your question. It's just I, I don't know. Okay, yeah, no. Thank you. All right, good. Uh, Pranav, how are you tonight and uh, you and yours? And, and uh, do you have any questions? I'm doing good, Mr. Bradley. Thanks for asking. Hope you're doing well as well. Uh, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. It is uh, Ryan Gruber is next in this uh, list. So, Ryan, how are you and yours doing? And do you have um, any questions or comments? It looks like Ryan is on mic, but I'm not hearing him, so I don't know uh, what might be going on there. Maybe it's a technical glitch or something like that. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, and, and by the way, you never know what's going on with COVID. I mean, I'm sure that there are uh, babies whose diapers need to be, oh, there he goes. That, that we heard from Ryan. Uh, he's good. So that is good. And Ryan, thank you for responding that way. That That is good that you did. Um, Vashish, uh, you are next. Uh, how are you and yours? And uh, do you have any questions? He is good and no questions. Okay, so that is good. Virginia, we are now to you. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, in, in, and by the way, Virginia, did I pick on you last time and make you do this last time too? No, you didn't. Okay, good. I, and again, I, I, don't, I don't like to pick on anybody, but I appreciate you doing it. Uh, okay, so how are you? And uh, do you have any questions you want to raise for the class? I'm good. Um, yeah, I actually have two questions. The first one is, um, when I was doing some practice problems, um, one of the questions was saying something about a linear system being consistent. So can you just explain what that means? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Consistent means there is at least one answer. There's at least one solution. And one of the theorems that we talked about in the videos or somewhere was with linear systems of equations, there are three things that can happen. You can have a unique solution, meaning there is one and only one. You can have no solutions, which means there is no, there are no solutions. And then you can also have a situation where there are an infinite number of solutions. And those are the only three possibilities. Now, and there's all kinds of jargon that people use in math and things like that. But for something that uh, has no solution, uh, the terminology is no solution means inconsistent. That's another way to say no solution. The systems are inconsistent one with another. Now, that leaves, what does it mean for consistent? So that means either there's a unique solution or there are an infinite number of solutions. And the way I will say that in maybe a more concise way, there's at least one solution. And again, I don't know exactly what will happen, but uh, when I was preparing tonight's lecture, uh, that actually all, all also comes up. So I'm glad you asked about that. So consistent means there's at least one solution. And there could be an infinite number of solutions. 
So that was my shot at answering your first question. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and then my second question was, when in the videos um, that you post on the announcements, when there's proofs or there's theorems and proofs, should we be writing down the proofs or trying to remember them? Like, will we have to use them later? Okay. Um, I will be asking you to prove things in this class because that's one of the oh, learning objectives or one of the of the goals of this class. So I will ask you to be proving um, things. Um, some of the proofs that I am doing will be um, in, in the videos and things like that will be very involved proofs. And on a, and I may ask you to prove something that's kind of involved, uh, but that would be a low stakes assessment where you could get help and you could collaborate and things like that. On high stakes assessments, I might also ask you to prove uh, something um, so that, you know, that, um, uh, that, that could happen. I guess what I'm going to say is, uh, and I'm going to try to give you the best, best guidance that I can. So what I'm going to say is, I think you should read carefully through the proofs and you should try to understand the proofs at a minimum. And if they're short proofs, and Jesse Hayes Carver and I will help you to sort of gauge what would be in scope, but I'm not going to ask you to, you know, if there's a five page proof, I'm not going to ask you to do that on a high stakes assessment. Now, someone uh, chimed in with a comment that I didn't really read here. Um, yeah, um, Chris uh, Wilson, uh, who knows some linear algebra, I think, uh, and Chris has studied with me before, and Chris uh, chimed in and he said, um, theorems and definitions are what you should memorize, I believe. Well, certainly you should memorize the theorems and definitions, but I also will say this, Virginia, not just to you, but also to Chris, there's a little bit more proofs in linear algebra uh, than there than there is um, in uh, oh like Chris and I studied differential equations once upon a time together uh, so anyway um, uh, more later about that but certainly you should um, understand the statements and results and definitions and uh, seek to understand the theorems too and if I go through some proofs tonight and which I plan to uh, I hope that uh, you know you'll ask questions if you have them. Um, uh, Virginia, anything else? And that's probably the best answer I can give you right now. Uh, anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And I think there is one more student. There is. Uh, Yasmin, you were uh, you were here. How are you? And do you uh, and in yours? And do you have any uh, oh questions or comments you want to raise for me or for the group? Hi, um, I'm good. I just had one or two questions. Please go ahead. Um, my first question was um, like about the proof thing. Um, I just finished 1.5 in the textbook. So would we be tested on like writing out the relations of the equivalent statements in 1.5.3 and how they relate? Um, perhaps in some... Um, Perhaps in some ways, and I, I'm going to be, maybe tonight, I'm going to be talking about um, some of those things. Uh, you should seek to understand them and be able to use them. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I, I know that might be uh, a bit of an unsatisfying answer, but that's probably the best that I really can do right now. I think you said you had another one, though. Yeah, um, just like to check on where we are at this point. Are we up to 1.5? Is that finished? Okay, you are the last student uh, speaking here. Um, and what I'm going to do to answer that question, and then I need to go back and talk about that low stakes assessment. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to share my application screen with you all. And your book is a Wiley book. Wiley is the publisher. 
And so I'm going to go look at the book. So I'm opening a new window. And I will have to go to, and their system is called Wiley Plus. Uh, W-I-L-E-Y, there it is, Wiley Plus. I really wanted to go to Wiley Plus, not search for it, but that's okay. And now I'm logging in. And Virginia, you see me searching for things now, right? Yes, I see it. Okay, and that's the last time I'm going to, I, I, to, I, I told you I was going to, let's see, that's Calculus 3. So I'm going back to, this is the linear algebra book that we're using. And here it comes. It's called a Wiley Course Resource. And I'm going to tell you where I think we are. Now, when I, when I answer this question, Yasmin and everybody else, I'm really going to be talking about um, uh, sort of where I think we are. So Gaussian elimination, we have done. Uh, matrices and matrix operations, we have done. Introduction to linear systems, we have done. And we've done 1.4. Tonight, um, if I finish the stuff that I'm prepared to go over with you, we will be finished with section 1.5 as well. And so if you're there, you're, you're right on track with this. Uh, I might end up making a video about some of this other stuff. Uh, I don't know. But you're right on track, and, and, and that's sort of where we're going. And I, was going to, um, I, I, and I was going to do a little bit of cockpit commentary. I think we are, we're almost reaching our cruising altitude and speed right now. And if we get back in class and we're settled on in class, then I'll feel good about that. And I might even I'll tell you you could uh, you know, unfasten your seatbelts. But... Uh, generally, they're good to keep them there. So, so if I end up talking about all this stuff about elementary matrices tonight, then we would be finished with chapter 1.5 or section 1.5. And Yasmin, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, now there was another student. I don't remember who it was, and I don't have to remember who it was. I stopped sharing, and I really should have continued sharing. I need to go back and fix that. Okay, so I'm going to share again, and I'm going to share the application screen again. And I'm going to go to the PowerPoint slides that I have for tonight, like talking points for the lecture. And here we go. Um, and let's see, where do I want to go? I think I want to go almost to the end of this. Uh, not really the end. Well, no, it is the end. It is. Oh, so here, are, here is, oh, LSA 2 and LSA 1. Let me show you LSA 1. And it is up here somewhere. Oh, boy, I had it here somewhere. What did I do with it? Oh, uh, boy. Let me look for it. Hold on. This isn't where it's supposed to be. I think I'm going to do LSA. I'm going to, and I apologize, but I have to do LSA 1 and LSA 2. I'm going to do that uh, right after the break. And the reason I'm doing that is I, I, it was not where I thought it was. And I'm a little shocked that it's not there, but um, oh well. Okay, so I think we're ready to dive into content now. So let's just begin diving into content, and content will start not there. That's all still COVID stuff. Ah, here is LSA1. I did find it. Okay. So now I'm back doing it again. Now, here is what I want you to do for LSA1. I will post that, but that's going to be in this video and it's in these slides. So this is LSA1, and it doesn't say this. And that's not how you spell elimination. There we go. That is better, I think. And this is going to be due to 7. Now, we were. 
when I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. We're supposed to be in class, so you can turn this in in class on February the 7th. But here is the problem. Now, it is a word problem, and here are the directions I want you to set up and solve. This is a linear system of equations uh, using Gaussian and Gauss-Jordan elimination. Now, those are two different techniques. Gaussian elimination, you make an upper triangular matrix and you know uh, solve it by back substitution. And here you uh, do pivoting and you, and you solve precisely with that. So I'm asking you to do both, but there's three things I'm asking you to do. So s read the problem, set it up, then solve using Gaussian uh, elimination, and then solve using Gauss-Jordan elimination, and it's due on February the 7th. Now, that's one week from tonight. That's plenty of time to do this. I will go ahead and read this for you. It is called Materials Mixing. A company produces three combinations of mixed vegetables, which it sells in one kilogram packages. Italian style combines um, three-tenths kilogram of zucchini, three-tenths uh, kilogram of broccoli, and four-tenths, um, that has to be kilograms again, of uh, carrots. French style combines six kilograms of broccoli and four kilograms of carrot. And they have a California style that combines uh, two kilograms of zucchini, uh, half a kilogram of broccoli and 0.3 kilograms of carrots. Now the company has stock in a warehouse somewhere of, boy, this is a lot of zucchini, broccoli, and carrots, uh, 16,200 kilograms of zucchini, uh, 41,400 kilograms of broccoli, and 29,400 kilograms of carrot. How many packages of each style should the company prepare in order to use up its supplies? Now, and, and one of the things about the LSAs is, you know, it's just to get you doing things and, and uh, maybe doing some collaboration and stuff like that. But also, this is a kind of problem that I really could ask you on a high stakes assessment. That's not always true, but certainly could be true. So this is LSA 1. This is due on 2-7. And I heard a little click, and I don't know if that was somebody. I'm going to stop sharing just in case somebody had some. Uh, comment on that. So I stopped sharing and now I need to figure out where I am. And I'll hear and I'll see if there's comments. Um, okay, will we have to turn this in, in in person or will there also be an option to upload our work to Blackboard for a turn in? Um, I guess since we started the, this this thing already, I will have an option for you to upload it to Blackboard. Uh, but in general, if people are coming to class, I'll try to make it worthwhile for people to come to class. I think it's going to be a little bit easier for you to hand it in in class. But I will, at least on this first one, maybe this first two, uh, allow you uh, both an, uh, you know uh, two options with that. Okay, and let's see. Okay, and, and that, that was just saying, okay, it was understood. Okay, let's go back to, um, hmm. okay, so I'm going to be sharing the application screen yet again. And we'll go for the sharing here and um, PowerPoint again and this one again, and now it is way down at the bottom of this is when I have LSA2. Now, you're not going to understand LSA2. Well, you might, but you might not. Uh, this is going to be on, due on Valentine's Day, 2.14, so that is two weeks from tonight, and it, do, and it has to do with input-output analysis, and this is a, uh, a model called Leon Tiff's uh, model of the economy, and I hope to talk about this so this problem would make sense um, later tonight, I hope. And if it doesn't make sense later tonight, it's maybe because I haven't talked about it. Um, and, and, and if that's the case, uh, I'll probably still have this due on the 14th, but I will talk about it sometime. Okay, so those are the two LSAs, and, and I will post those in the syllabus tab, although I haven't done that uh, yet. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and I'm going to start plowing through stuff. And we're going to spend roughly a half an hour uh, talking about this stuff. Okay. Now, um, okay, so I'm just going, and I'm going to, let's see. 
and, and Virginia, you don't always have to say yes, you just have to say no if it's no. So I think we should be all looking at a uh, PowerPoint slide that says uh, finding inverse matrices. And I, when I'm going through this, I am assuming that you've watched all the videos that I posted and understand them. Now, I realize that might be an unrealistic assumption. You know, some people, they, they work on the weekends or maybe they've worked ever since I posted those or, you know, so uh, you're not in, in trouble if you haven't looked at it, but you, you want to look at them eventually. But I'm going to assume that. So we had uh, actually talked about uh, in the videos, we talked about a lot of things called elementary um, oh, things and stuff like that. And, and we had moved ourselves to. Uh, the point where we're ready to talk about, and I believe this is section uh, 1.5 that Yasmin was uh, mentioning uh, that's in the book. So this is this deals with section 1.5. I might not state the theorems exactly the same way, but they're kind of the same thing. Okay, uh, so earlier we did talk about inverse matrices, what they were, uh, and we did talk about how to find them, but we talked about what they were. And we also talked about elementary matrices. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a review in this, but I'm not repeating the lecture. It's, it's there. Uh, but in this section, we're going to end up with a method for actually finding the inverse of a matrix. And by the way, to do that LSA2, you do have to invert a matrix. And uh, we'll see how this involves elementary uh, matrices and so on and so forth. So we, get, we begin with a theorem. And here is the theorem. And this is very much, I think, the kind of theorem that Yasmin was, was uh, referencing. Um, uh, and so I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about it. So what the theorem says is, if A is a square that is an N by N matrix, then the following statements are equivalent. Now, equivalent means if you have one of them, you have the other one. Okay. And... Um, so all these things mean exactly the same thing, or from a proof standpoint, it will be A if and only if B, B if and only if C, C if and only if D. And just going back, I might not ask you to reproduce this proof, but I might ask you to prove something that requires you to reference one of these theorems. And so, you know, knowing the statements and the theorems and what they mean is really important. Okay, now all these things are if and only if, and it would be a brutal thing for me to say, okay, we're going to prove if A, then B, and if B, then A. Now, and we could do it that way, and then we could go to B, and we could say if B, then C, if C, then A. But we're going to do it a little trickier than that, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to start with A, we're going to assume that that is true, and we'll show that B has to be true. Then we're going to assume that B has to be true, and we're going to show that if B is true, then C has to be true. And then we're going to assume if C is true, then D has to be true. And then finally, and this is called the transitive property of um, oh, if-then statements or something like that. Uh, sometimes it's called hypothetical syllogism in logic. And then finally, we're going to say if D is true, then A has to be true. But you see, we daisy-chain through all these. A implied B, B implies C, C implies D, and D implies A. So really, we've got all these things are equivalent. These are if and only if kind of statements. And that's kind of what these words say and, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's, uh, let's advance the slide and see what else we got. And this is talking about what I was saying. So, and, and I think you can see my cursor wiggling up here. Uh, and so it's uh, A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, and that implies A. Now, we are going to go through this, so anyway, we will go, go through this. So A implies B. Now, to prove A implies B, we're assuming that A is true. And A said that A, the matrix A, is invertible. That means there is an inverse. So we're going to have to show that that implies that AX equals zero will have only the trivial solution. Now, if I set up an equation that is A times X, that's matrix A times vector X is equal to zero, I know if I take every X to be zero, that means that's the zero vector and there will be a solution and that is called the trivial solution. 
Uh, but it's possible for us to have, those will be called homogeneous uh, equations, and it's possible for there to be non-trivial uh, solutions. Uh, and that's where, you know, we have um, uh, an infinite number of solutions, perhaps. So we could have um, things that are that, but what we're saying is, oh, but if A is invertible, you will only have the trivial solution. Well, here's the way the proof happens. We start with... Uh, x0, x sub 0, and that's a specific solution to the system. So that means a times x0 is equal to 0. But we also said that a inverse exists. So I can operate on the left side with a inverse. So this, so on both sides. So I'm doing the same thing to both sides. And you knew how to do that from your algebra. So I multiply both uh, sides by uh, a inverse. So on the um, Left-hand side, I have a inverse a times x0 is equal to a inverse times 0. But a linear transformation of the 0 vector has to be 0. And a inverse times a as matrix is going to be the identity matrix. And the identity matrix is just x0. So x0 is equal to 0. So ax has only the trivial solution. And we have now proven that a implies b. Now, it is important that you understand proofs, so I'm going to pause in case somebody wants to ask questions about this, but if not, I'll say, yeah, this is pretty good. And uh, I'm not giving you exactly the proof that's in your book, uh, but it's probably similar. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, this is what we've got. So I'm going to pause uh, for a, um, a count of um, that noise that you hear in the background is my phone going off. And I'm getting a, a spam call. And I should have turned that whole thing off, but I didn't. Uh, so anyway, uh, so any questions on this? I'll count to five, Mississippi. OK, I didn't hear any questions, so I'm going to assume that that's good. And now we're going to go and we're going to do something different. We're going to assume that B is true and show that that implies C. OK, so now B was, we are to, su uh, to assume that anytime we have AX equals 0, we only have the trivial solution. And we need to show that A is rho equivalent to the n-dimensional identity matrix. Now, what that means is that if we provide these elementary row operations, and you probably kind of know what the elementary row operations are, but if not, you know, watch the videos again. But uh, that we need to show that A is row equivalent to that. That means that I could start with A. I could do these uh, row um, equivalent operations uh, on A, these elementary operations on A, and I can turn it into the identity matrix. And here, I guess, uh, it says, recall the two matrices are row equivalent if we get from one to the other by applying a finite set of elementary row operations. And elementary row operations is you're adding a multiple of one oh, equation to the other, and so on and so forth. OK, so uh, what I start out with is uh, with this proof, then. And we're assuming that AX equals 0 has only the trivial solution. So I start out writing the augmented matrix. So you see all of these A's that are here, uh, which is n by n. Um, so those are the coefficient matrices. And the right-hand side, everything is equal to 0. And what I've really done is that's an expanded way with an augmented matrix to write AX is equal to 0. OK. Now we're assuming, because that's the if part, that we have only the trivial solution, meaning that all of these are solutions. And that's the only solution. Therefore, we also know what the reduced row echelon form of the augmented matrix must be. It has to be once down the diagonal, and these are all equal to 0. Now, the entries in the last column, those are all the zeros stacked on top of each other, do not affect the values in the entries in the first n columns. So if we take the same set of elementary row operations that we did to get to this point, and apply them to the matrix A, we will get the identity matrix because that's what's sitting right here. And if you think about it, that's what we've said was going to be proven. 
So I'm going to count to five, Mississippi, in case anybody wants to ask a question about this. And sometimes you say, I don't want to ask a question, but I want to think about that more. You have the opportunity to think about it more. So I hit uh, five Mississippis. OK, now C implies D. Now we're going to assume that A is row equivalent to IN. And we need to show that A can be written as a product of elementary matrices. Now, this might be something that, that uh, you're going to have to take a little bit on faith right now. And the reason you're taking it on faith is that I proved in some of those videos that I posted um, that um, these that there are elementary row operations, and those are equivalent to elementary matrices. And those were in the videos that I posted. Uh, now you, and, and actually it's not hard stuff, but it's stuff that you need to think about. Uh, but the, the, the thing to think about right now, I suppose, is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between elementary row operations and the things that we call as elementary uh, matrices. So suppose that those row operations are represented by elementary matrices, uh, E1, E2, E standing for elementary, dot, 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 all the way down to EK. Then um, row operations, and it talks about this theorem four, that's one that's in my, uh, in the thing I had before, that applying each row operation to A is the same thing as multiplying on the left of A by the elementary row operations in the same order. So we will have this. So you see uh, there are E1 through AK that if I multiply this way uh, on A, I will get the, um, the identity matrix. And we learned that um, uh, what we could do um, it is uh, we could apply the um, inverses in the reverse order. So the first inverse that I'm going to apply is E k inverse. And notice ek inverse is the first one down here. It's the one furthest right. And then I do, and I go all the way down to e1 inverse. And by the way, I also proved that these elementary matrices were invertible as well. So to really understand this proof, you want to make sure you see that. But I think you can kind of get the flavor of the proof right now. So what we do is we start with this equation that I'm waving my cursor under. And we'll just start hitting this. So first thing is I'll do I'll do E inverse. And so that will kill off this, making that the identity matrix. And then I will do uh, E uh, K minus 1 inverse and so on. So I'll keep doing that. So anyway, I'll kill off all of these E's and I'll be left with A. But that says that A uh, is equal to uh, E1 inverse, E2 inverse, so on and so forth, and that times this is A. So you see what we're supposed to say is that A can be written by a product of elementary matrices, and the inverse of uh, elementary matrices is our elementary matrices, and you see that we say, oh, A is that product of those. Now, we really didn't know what A was, but we know the theorems, and we applied the theorems, so we proved that A is the product of elementary matrices, and therefore that is D. Now we've got one more thing that we're going to do. We're going to do D implies A, uh, but before we do that, I want to um, uh, pause. I'm pausing just for a count of five, Mississippi, in case somebody wants to ask some questions about this. Okay, I didn't hear anything, so we'll go on. The last thing is going to be D implying A. Now here we're going to assume that A is a product of elementary matrices, and we need, we need to show it's invertible. But this is really easy to prove because one of the theorems that I proved before was if, uh, if two matrices or even three matrices are invertible, the product of invertible matrices is also invertible. And I also proved that the inverse uh, of A times B times C is C inverse times B inverse times A inverse. It's in the reverse order. That's probably theorem five. Uh, so therefore, it's really easy to say A is invertible since it's written as the product of invertible matrices, and we've proven uh, this assertion. Again, I'm going to count to five Mississippi, but I think this theorem is finished. And this is um, 
somewhat like the theorem that I think it was Yasmin was talking about. Okay, great. Uh, now, there are two other, and, and I know this is listed as one theorem, but there's, a, there's two things that happen here. And it really is kind of an interesting thing because when I defined the inverse, I said, oh, it had to be a inverse. Uh, let's see, it had to work on both sides to be an inverse. And um, this theorem is saying, oh, just kidding. If you have an inverse that works on one side, it has to work on the other. Now I'm going to stay, that's my, my slang for describing the theorem. Uh, but um, I, now I'm going to quote the theorem. So the theorem says, suppose that A is a square matrix. If B is a square matrix such that B times A is equal to I, then A is invertible and A inverse is equal to B. So you see B is the inverse, but it only has to happen on one side. And part B of this theorem is the same thing except on the other side. It says if B is a square matrix such that a times B is the identity, then A is invertible, and the inverse is B. Okay, and we're going to be doing a, a, a theorem later on that will require part B, but we're going to start with, uh, with part A. Okay, so we're saying, uh, suppose that, uh, let's see. Okay, if we can show that AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, then we will know that A is invertible. And that was one of the conclusions that we should have. So you see, we're going to assume that this is true, and we're going to use one of those conditions that we had from the previous theorem. But we know that that is equivalent to A being uh, invertible. So let X zero be any solution to this. And we're trying to show it has only the trivial solution. So A times the vector zero is equal to zero. But then I'm going to take B of both sides. Now B, A of X zero is the same thing then as B of the zero uh, vector and B, uh, a linear thing of a zero vector is the zero vector. And we already by the if part of this theorem said that B A is I, so that says X zero equals zero. So you see we showed that uh, this only has the trivial solution. That means that A is invertible. And if A is invertible, this, uh, this shows that, um, and we know from the previous section, inverses are unique. That's another thing that I proved. And because BA equals I, we must have that B is A inverse. And the other uh, part is going to really be very much the same. Uh, we let X0 be a solution to uh, any solution to BX equals 0. And then we multiply on both sides. And we show that uh, x0 must be the trivial solution. That means that a is invertible and b inverse equals a. Uh, let's see, that's not quite what we were asked to prove, but it does give us the proof because b is invertible and its inverse has to be a because uh, a times b is i. So um, that's the proof. And we are going to use part b in a later theorem. Okay, now what we've done then is we've expanded previously in a previous theorem. I don't know if it's, it might have been called theorem one. Uh, we showed that uh, A, if A, then B, if B, then C, if C, then D, and if D, then A. So now uh, what we have to do is we're, we have two more things that we can add to this theorem, and we're also saying they're equivalent. So we have, to, we have to show that something implies this, this implies that, and that goes all the way back to A. So we have to show there's an equivalence here of these two, but uh, the first four are already done. Okay, now, okay, so here we go. Uh, note that E and F appear to be the same on the surface, but recall that, and, and um, wow, Virginia, I think it was you, and it doesn't matter if it was you or not, but someone asked a question about consistent. We're using consistent right here. This is what I was talking about. Okay, so note that E and F appear to be the same on the surface, but recall that consistent only says there's at least one solution. That means it's not inconsistent. So inconsistent means there are no solutions. So it could have one solution or it could have n number of solutions. So um, 
when you say it's consistent, you're just saying, oh, there is a solution for every B, but E doesn't say the same thing. B, uh, e says there's exactly one solution for every N by one um, uh, matrix or vector. Okay, so let's go back to what I'm doing. So if a solution is consistent, there may be infinitely many solutions. Okay, uh, so let's talk about how we prove this, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's show that A implies E, implies F, and then F in turn will apply A, and that you know ties this all into a knot. So that's the way we're going. I am watching the time for us, and we're doing just, uh, just fine. Okay, so this is A implies E. That means we're going to assume that A is true and show that E is true. Okay, so A says A is invertible. And we need to show that this has exactly one solution. Well, that's really very easy to do. And, and um, Yasmin, I would expect you to do, not just Yasmin, but everybody, I would expect you to be able to do proofs like this one because you see, I just say, oh, AX equal B, but then I can hit both sides with A inverse. So A inverse times A is I, and that's X. So X equals A inverse B, and that's the answer. So if A is invertible, we've shown the solution is going to be A inverse times B. And since matrix multiplication is unique, we don't get two answers when we do multiplication. The solution must also be unique, and there's exactly one solution. Now we will look at uh, showing that E implies F. So we're assuming that E is true, and we will have to show F. Now, this implication is trivial. By the way, I didn't write this because... And, and mathematicians are very inclined to uh, to do this. And sometimes it means, oh, I'm too lazy to write this down. Sometimes they think it's trivial, but there's a lot of people who are way smarter than me. And so uh, I read a lot of math papers, and when I do, they'll say, well, this is really tri a trivial calculation. Sometimes I spend hours doing that calculation because it wasn't trivial for me. But anyway, here we go. Uh, so we start out by assuming that the system AX equal B has exactly one solution for every matrix B. But that also means the system is consistent because we've shown that there's at least one solution. There's not no solutions. So we're done with this. You might have to think about that again, and that's okay because you're building connections with the definitions and everything else. Okay, now we're coming to F implies A. Okay, so we start off by assuming that AX equal B is consistent. Now, again, going back to that, that means, hey, there are solutions to this, okay? And there's solution for every N by one matrix B. We need to show that this uh, implies it's invertible. So if AX equal B is consistent for every N by one matrix B, it's consistent for the following systems. And you've got, um, a whole bunch of systems there. And notice that what I'm doing is I'm picking all those to be uh, the, the identity. Since we know each of these systems have solutions, uh, take those solutions and form a new matrix B whose uh, entries are those solutions as columns. Now look at the product A times B. If you a, do A times B, and you do have to think about this, this is the partition of matrices that I don't know if I talked about it in the actual lecture. I talked about it um, uh, in one of the video lectures, but I did. And so you have to think through this, but that means that A times B is the identity matrix. I'm sure you've shown that's the identity matrix. But then by theorem two, which means we only had to show this on one side, A must be invertible and we're done with the proof. So you see, you've got a whole bunch of equivalent statements. And I think we just pile on and on and on. We have many more equivalent statements that will happen as we go throughout this course. And I think it even gets into the, I don't think it gets into the double digits alphabets, but it gets back into like LM in OP maybe or something. There's like a, a, a like many, many statements that are equivalent. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Now, before proceeding, we should notice that in part C of this theorem, we showed that if we reduce the coefficient matrix down to reduced row echelon form, it became the identity matrix, okay? And we saw that in the proof of the theorem. But that actually helps us determine 
a, an approach for finding the inverse. Okay, so please try to follow along. First, let's assume that A is invertible. So all the statements in theorem three are true. And that means that there are elementary matrices E1, E2, down through EK, such that if I operate in the following way, I have uh, A, E1, E2, all the way to EK, I get the identity matrix. Now, since we know that A is invertible, and we know all of these things are invertible, I can take the inverse. We know A inverse exists. And if I take A inverse times the identity matrix, there's A inverse sitting right there. But now I'm going to substitute for the identity matrix this thing that I have here. But the identity matrix times A inverse is A inverse. So A inverse equals, I mean, there's A inverse. So A inverse has to be everything that's being multiplied by um, A. And I'm going to call this the identity matrix. And so you see, this is what A inverse is. Now you might say, what the hell does this mean? Well, here it's the, here's the punchline. What this tells us is that if we find a series of row operations that will reduce A to IN, then applying the same set of operations to the identity matrix will be the inverse. And this is, in fact, the algorithm that we're going to use to find the inverses. Now I'm going to talk about this page. We're about ready for a break, but not quite yet. Okay, so here is the way we do it. And it turns out that we can do both of these steps simultaneously um, in the following way. So we will set up an augmented matrix, and, we're, and, and this is the way we're going to invert the matrix A. So we set up an augmented matrix uh, this way, and we have here is A in the left-hand component, then I put a slash, and then I have, and, and by the way, both of these are in by n, okay? Um, so I put a slash or a vertical, whatever that is, a vertical bar, and then I put the uh, nth i. So this is an n by n matrix with the i's down the diagonal and zero elsewhere. But now what we're going to do is we're going to want to work through with elementary row operations, but we're going to be doing it on the augmented matrix. And so we're going to go through and we're going to do all those elementary row operations. And we're going to put this into the identity matrix, which means we're doing Gauss-Jordan elimination, but we're doing it on the whole augmented matrix. So everything we're changing over here, we're changing over here. And so whenever you hit the I sub n, assuming you didn't make an arithmetic mistake, what you should have is the inverse on the other side. Now, that means, uh, now, um, it's possible, and we'll deal with that in a bit, but it's possible when you're going through and doing these things uh, that you will crash and burn along the way. You won't be able to get here, and that will mean the matrix is singular. There is no uh, inverse, but we'll uh, be doing that oh, in a bit. Now, I do watch what time it is, so I want to check, and it is, uh, is 8.14, which means I'm about ready to dismiss you. Um, uh, I am going to pause, and don't worry about this. If you ask a question now, I just, uh, you know, tack on additional times for your break. So, uh, so what I'm going to be doing right now is I'm pausing for a, um, a count of um, 10 Mississippi in case people want to ask questions about what we do. And when we come back, we're going to calculate some inverses and do some more stuff. Okay, so I'm counting to 10 Mississippi. Uh, but do ask questions if you got them now. They're best asked now. Okay, uh, my um, Hewlett Packard thing says it is uh, 8.15. I'm going to call it 8.16, and we'll reconvene at um, 8.26, and uh, we'll do some uh, calculations using this technique.
and then maybe we'll talk about the Leon Tuff TIF thing. We'll see. Okay, so we're on break now. Uh, 8.26 is when we come back. We're on break now.
Okay, my clock says uh, 26 past, so I'm going to advance the slide. And uh, by the way, if you're watching this uh, recorded video, I don't bother to uh, shut off the recording because then I have to remember to put it back on and, it, and then there's two recordings. And it's just a mess. So uh, if we hit a break, you just say, oh, it's 10 minutes and then you fast forward and uh, you, know, you can watch it relatively efficiently uh, on, uh, on YouTube or wherever you're watching it. Okay, so here we're just gonna take a two by two matrix and we're going to work through and do this. Now here is the way we proceed to do this. So the matrix is uh, minus four, minus two, five and five. And uh, we're saying given that it is invertible because we really haven't talked about, well, what happens if it's not invertible? Although we'll see what happens there. So this is two by two. So the first thing that we will do is we will, and I'm wiggling my cursor down here. It's in a little bit different order than I'm talking about this. So we form the augmented matrix. So here is A over here. I'm wiggling my cursor and I put the two by two identity over here. So now I'm going to have to work to turn this into one, one, zero, zero using elementary row operations. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to begin doing this and I'm going to do row one plus row two becomes the new row one. So you see if I add these, I get minus four and five, that gives me a one and five and uh, minus two gives me three and I didn't change anything else. So that's what I did there. But now I have the one where I need it. But now I'm going to have to um, uh, make this five into a zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take minus five times row one and add that to row two and that becomes the new row two. Well, when I do that, uh, I'm taking minus five and five is going to give me a zero and uh, let's see, and uh, that's going to be minus 15, and that's going to give me a minus 10 when I do that. So you see I've eliminated this, and um, uh, sometimes in uh, linear programming and things like that, you will call this a pivot. But you see now I've, I've, I've made this into, I, I'm doing um, basically Gauss-Jordan elimination. But now I need to go over here, and, and the, the pivot is going to happen on this minus 10. I want to, and, and by the way, all these changes that I'm doing, I'm doing across both of the augmented matrices. So you see these numbers over here are changing too. And there is quite a bit of calculation that can be involved in doing this, but we're going through it. Okay, so now I need to make this into one because I wanna have one, one and zero elsewhere, one's along the diagonal. So I multiply this by minus 10 times row two and I call that the new row two and now I have what I need there. And now I have to, I'm pivoting on this. So I'm going to take um, minus three times row two and I'm gonna add it to uh, row one that becomes the new row uh, one. And then I'm finally finished. I have one, zero and zero, one. And when I've done all of that work over here, I found the inverse of the matrix. And that's assuming I didn't make any arithmetic mistake. And I do expect you to be able to do these calculations, uh, not for a 10 by 10 matrix, but uh, perhaps for a two by two or three by three, or maybe even a four by four. Uh, so anyway, quite a bit of calculation, but we've now done this. Now, this was kind of a big deal because now we've talked about the algorithm for computing an inverse. So I'm gonna pause uh, for a count of 10 Mississippi in case people wanna ask questions about this technique. Okay, so that is, um, I'm calling that good to go and let's go on to something else and probably another example. Now here uh, is a three by three. And again, it says uh, find the inverse given that it is invertible. They're telling you it's invertible. They haven't talked about, and, and, and again, you recall that if something is invertible, we call it non-singular. And if it uh, uh, doesn't have an inverse, we call it singular. And, um, I'm not gonna talk about the math history origin of those words, but anyway, we need to do this. Now, it's gonna be the same thing, the same process. And I would encourage you to, 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 to when you're doing, you know, studying or something like that, to take some of this and actually try to do it and see that you get the same answer because the inverse is going to be unique. But so we're gonna take this, we put this in the left part, 
we make uh, here we've started using dotted lines I don't know where that started but now we've got dotted lines there and then over here we start with a matrix set, but now we're going to do Gauss uh, uh, Jordan elimination over here but when we're doing it over here on the left hand side we're doing it on the entire augmented matrix when we're doing this and we go through and we do this and and I uh, think you should probably practice doing this yourself but we find that the inverse is this three by three business that's listed down here okay and you could verify that this works but if you didn't make a, a mistake it, uh, it 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 happens now now we are going to turn our attention to uh the question of um well what happens if it doesn't have an inverse and we'll look at that but basically what happens is you still just try to do this but you'll crash and burn you're not going to be able to turn it into the identity matrix you'll get some zeros as a row so let's uh, let's look at an example of that. Now here is a three by three, and you don't know this a priori, but uh, what what's going to happen is this matrix doesn't have an inverse; it is a singular matrix, and uh, we're just going to say, well, yeah, but we don't know that, so let's try to um, solve this the same way. So we um, jump in and we start trying to do it. And so we set up our uh, augmented matrix that looks like this. And then we start trying to do Gauss-Jordan elimination here. And we're hoping to get one, one, one down the diagonals and zero elsewhere. So we start doing it. And for a while, things look pretty good. Uh, but then we'll get down to, and eventually, when we get to this step and try to go one step further, uh, what we will do is um, we, we uh, will... Uh, uh, want to get a um, we want to try to get a one here uh, but what happens is that if you look at this second row and third column I'm just telling you what's going to happen if you look at the second row and third column what will happen is that the uh, the third not column Jim row 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 so if you look at the second row and the um, and the um, third column but third damn it all right here we go if you look at the second row and the third row you can see that the third row is a multiple of the uh, second row it is six times it and and maybe you don't realize it right away but that means when you try to do this calculation uh, what will happen is it will uh, you'll crash and burn and you will get zero 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 now that means you can't get this all the way to uh, 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 well, you can't get it to be upper triangular, and 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 you can't get into the Gauss Jordan, and so you've crashed and burned here, and that means that this is um, um, non-singular, or it it does not have an inverse. I, I I said that wrong. It is singular, and it that means it does not have an inverse. I'm going to count to five, Mississippi, just in case there's questions on this. Okay, didn't hear any questions. I hope you're still out there. Virginia, you guys are still out there, right? Yeah, we're here. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. All right, so, hmm. Okay, that's what happens. You crash and burn, and that's that's really that story. Now, it turns out that with a two by two matrix, you could do this in general. And here's the formula. And 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 I'm not asking you to remember a lot of formulas. You could always derive this formula. Uh, but uh, here here's a nice theorem, and this is a good way to determine if it's invertible. It turns out that this formula is not completely generalizable, but for two by twos, it's good to remember. And I bet you Chris Wilson remembers this because when we were solving uh, non-homogeneous systems of uh, uh, differential equations uh, we had to use uh, inverse matrices and I reminded you guys of this formula and and Chris uh, actually knew it then and he knows it now so anyway it is here so let me quote the theorem so the matrix A capital A equals A B C D there where those are scalars is invertible if A D minus BC does not equal to zero. Now AD 
is 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 multiplying this way and um and uh bc is multiplying the other way but it's ad minus bc now some of you who've studied elements of linear algebra will uh, remember oh that's the determinant and so part of this 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 uh this theorem does generalize if the determinant of a matrix is not equal to zero then the matrix does have an inverse and uh if it's equal to zero then it doesn't have an inverse but the formula for the inverse doesn't work exactly that way. There's a similar thing, but it's actually much more complicated with cofactors and stuff like that. And we'll study that uh, later. But this is a useful theorem because if, I'm, if you're on a test or something and you don't care as much as you might in a different class, in my class, you, you know, I give you time uh, you know, in the testing center so you don't have to, um, you don't have to uh, hurry and do things, but this is a quick way to uh, to have the inverse. And uh, I actually was working with a guy uh, the other day in the Learning Commons, and uh, he too was studying differential equations, and he remembered this formula from some algebra class he took. So anyway, it was good. Uh, and so it's one over the value of the determinant, uh, and then you switch the A and D and then you put minuses on the B and C, and that might not be easy to remember, I don't know, but there it is. Okay, so let's go down and look at this uh, little example. So here is a matrix. If I do this guy times this guy, it is minus 20, so this is minus 20, minus to minus 10, and, and so uh, minus to minus is a plus, this is negative 10, the stat's not equal to zero. And then I just do, let's see, what do I do? I switch the A and D, and I make these negatives each other, and I put one over the value of the determinant, and I do get the uh, uh, the two by two inverse. And so that's uh, that's a formula. It's probably worth uh, remembering. And here we could do it again, except here you get minus 12. This is minus 12 minus a minus 12. That's zero. So that thing is singular, and that's a that's a good thing to uh, to know. So you would just say, hey, there's no inverse. This is a singular matrix because the value of the determinant is equal to uh, zero. All right, now we come to uh, an important application. And uh, this guy, uh, I think he is Pol was Polish. I think he is deceased now. Uh, and, and he won the Nobel Prize in, uh, in economics with this uh, application of matrix theory. And he also was really an amazing dude uh, because not only did he win the Nobel Prize, but I don't know if it is two or three of his students also won Nobel Prizes in economics. So he's a very prolific guy. I think he was Polish. And his app, and you could look him up if you wanted to. Um, anyway, his application of matrices had to do with interdependencies in economies, and this was called input-output analysis. Now, I got to tell you, the thing he did was enormous. I think he did something like, and don't quote me on this, and and you know we could look up his original papers, but he did this for oh 500 different sectors and 42. I, I, I don't know, it was, it was an enormous analysis and it gathered tons of data and everything else. And it really was um, very amazing. And, and he didn't have a lot of technology to throw at this either back in the day. So a lot of this calculation was uh, sort of gut rich in calculation. Now we're not going to do, and, and as it says, in practice, it's very complicated with many variables. Um, like I think he might have had 500 different sectors and 42 variables. Don't quote me on that. But in practice, it's very complicated. Uh, and we're only going to talk about small examples. But I think you can appreciate what he did and say, oh, yeah, that was pretty smart. OK, so here is the, uh, here's the idea then. Uh, Input-output models are concerned with the production and flow of goods and services. A typical economy is composed of a number of different sectors and such as manufacturing, industry, transportation, agriculture, and so on and so forth. And people who study economics have defined these sectors. Each sector requires input from other sectors and possibly from itself. In fact, I would say almost invariably from itself to produce its output. 
For example, manufacturing output requires energy. You see, they have to buy the energy to run their plants to build their stuff. Uh, they have to have transportation because they get goods, goods that are shipped in that they make into stuff. And also, they don't make everything from scratch. Like if you're building a car, you'll buy your batteries from someone else and so on, and you'll assemble it into a car. So anyway, um, that's kind of the idea. If an economy has N sectors, then the inputs required by the various sectors from each other to produce their outputs can be described by an N by N matrix called the input output matrix, or sometimes people call this the technological matrix. Okay, so here's a thing, and we're going to look at um, oh, a matrix in a moment. So let's talk about the words first. Suppose a simplified economy involves just three sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and transportation. And these are all in appropriate units. And we're, I'm not dealing with the units right now. So the production of one unit of agriculture requires a half unit of manufacturing. And the reason is that the farmers need to buy tractors. So somebody had to manufacture the trans, uh, that. And uh, one quarter unit of transportation because they have to send their um, goods to market or something. Okay, uh, moreover, the production of one unit of manufacturing requires a quarter unit of agriculture. You might say, well, why is that? The people have to eat who are doing the manufacturing and a quarter unit of transportation because they have to drive to work, for example. And last but not least, the production of one unit of transportation requires one third of agriculture. They have to eat two and a quarter unit of manufacturing because somebody has to build the cars and trucks. So write the input output matrix of this economy. So here is what you're starting with in, is this. Now, it is a little bit arbitrary, but what we show here is that the inputs are shown as rows over here. So you have agriculture, manufacturing, and transportation. And the outputs you get, agriculture, manufacturing, and transportation. So you're having, you know, these. this is a closed economy, I guess. Actually, I don't know if that's the word that they use here. But anyway, that's, that's what you got. Uh, and so anyway, you see where those things go. So for example, and this is actually very bogus. In the real world, you would not have zeros along this diagonal. You would have numbers as well. And, um, and, and you know, and, and so on and so forth. And so this isn't really a, a good example, but you get the idea. So this is input and output. And so to get uh, one output of um, agriculture, you need a half a unit of manufacturing going into there. And anyway, what, what Leontief did was got all this data together. It was a massive data uh, exercise and he described the uh, United States economy in, uh, in ways that uh, you know, no one had, uh, had done before. Okay, let's look at another example then. Uh, okay, so consider the economy, which was the one we just talked about. And so suppose this economy uh, produces uh, 60 units of agriculture, 52 units of manufacturing, and uh, 48 units of transportation. Write this as a column matrix. Well, there it is. Because this was agriculture, manufacturing, and transportation. And that matrix is called the production matrix. Now, how much from each sector is used up in the production process? And here I'm calling production process, which is fine. But sometimes you'll say how much of it is internally consumed. And in fact, if you have to consume more than you manufacture, you have to uh, import from outside. And if you make more, you can export is kind of what's going on. Okay, so uh, how much from each sector is used up in the production process? Well, since one quarter unit of agriculture is used to produce each unit of manufacturing, and there are 52 units of manufacturing, uh, you're using 13 units of uh, agriculture. And similarly, one third unit of agriculture is used to produce a unit of transportation. So 16 units of agriculture are used by transportation. Therefore, 29 units of agriculture are used up in this economy. And actually, I, I told you it was bogus having zeros down the diagonal. Agriculture would eat some of itself as well. And so here's some other examples of that uh, that you can do. 
Now, part C is the more interesting part, though, and it says um, uh, describe the conclusions of part B in terms of the input output matrix and the production matrix. Well, the way you do that is you will take A times X. Now, this is what is internally consumed is A times X, and this is what is consumed. Now, in part D, it said find the matrix D, which is the demand, and this is X minus A times X, and explain what it represents. Well, I just told you what it represented, because you see X is, um, uh, the demand is some external demand uh, that you're trying perhaps to meet, and uh, uh, X um, uh, was, uh, you know, what, what you started with here. Uh, but then you're going to subtract the stuff that is consumed to produce it. So it's kind of like this is your gross, and then you have to subtract off the cost, uh, which is here. And if you do all that calculation, you get this. So this means you would have 31, 10, and 20 available to service an external demand. And D is called the demand matrix. Now, so D is the demand matrix. That's what you have available to export. Then you have X minus A, X. Now, I'm going to do some algebra down here, but now I'm doing matrix algebra. And you can understand the matrix algebra now because uh, we've talked about it. And uh, you see, so D uh, equals X minus A, X. And that's the same thing as the identity times X. And X is on the right side. Matrix uh, multiplication is not commutative. But I can factor the X out. And I'm left with I minus A. So you see, now if I minus A is invertible, if it has an inverse, then I can solve this. I can multiply on the left side. Again, matrix multiplication is not commutative. So I multiply on the left side by I minus A inverse. And so I get uh, I minus A inverse here, I minus A inverse here, that kills this off, makes it into the identity, and that's just X. So X is equal to I minus A inverse. So the way this problem would be read then is, in order to meet an external demand of something, some vector, how much would you have to do? And the solution is uh, I minus A inverse times D. And again, we use the matrix inverse. And here's a little example of that. So suppose uh, that in a three-sector uh, economy, this is the same economy we've been studying. There's demand for 516 agriculture, 258 manufacturing, and 129 transportation. Okay, so D is equal to uh, this. I think I fucked this up. Uh, there, there has to be a number up here, and I didn't put it there. Um, there's a, it's 516, 258, and uh, uh, 129. So that's what it's supposed to be. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, I know from my theory then I'm going to do uh, I, which is the identity matrix, minus my consumption matrix or technology matrix, whatever you call that. Um, and so you subtract those two, you get this. And then I have to inverse, it, take find the inverse of this. And this is numerically done, so that's a numerical inverse. But you get that as the inverse. And so the solution is x is equal to i minus a inverse times d. And you can do that. And you find out this is what you have to produce. And these things probably were rounded off numerically. Uh, here's another example about wheat and oil. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that because I know what time it is. And but the solution is here if you want to look at it. And here's the LSA, and this is just doing one of those. And notice that this is a better example because this uh, th this doesn't have a zero down here. And uh, this is going to be due on Valentine's Day. Okay, so uh, let me go see what time it is. I think we're almost done. My gosh, we are exactly done. Uh, you guys be careful, and we'll do this again on Wednesday the same way, and one week from tonight, hopefully we're doing it uh, in class. Okay, you all be careful, and uh, well, thank you all, but Virginia, thank you for uh, your help with this, uh, this thing tonight. Uh, so I will turn off the, uh, the recording, and uh, we're done for the evening. So good night, guys. Thank you.